Hello, and welcome to another Center for Progressive Urban Politics podcast. I am joined today by my colleague, KMO, and our special guest, Cliff High. Uh, by way of introduction, for those who, who are listeners who may not know him, KMO is a podcaster of the long-running C Realm, C is for Consciousness uh, podcast series. He's also an illustrator. And he has been helping, he's actually been the driving force behind our Geb uh, cartoon. Uh, he's initially started just as the illustrator, and now he is the creative mind behind all of it, the writing and the illustrating. So it's really exciting that KMO and I get to sit down with the very famous Cliff High. And our audience that may not know Cliff, uh, Cliff, uh, has gained a lot of notoriety over the last couple years through the application of his emotional reduction algorithm or predictive linguistics, which in the 2016 election, he made some predictions long before using his technology and all of it was just kind of hauntingly accurate. And uh, a couple years ago, I started subscribing to his alt reports from his Half Past Human site, and I've kind of used them to steer a lot of our activities with the Center for Progressive Urban Politics, as well as other organizations like PFIR, U.S. Tech Workers, and others. So without any further ado, Cliff, it is so great to have you on our show today. Thank you very much. Kind of cool that you um, that you used it for navigating. How did it work out for you? Actually, very well. There was a point. It was into. It was the winter of 2016. You had talked oh, about immigration. Those were good sets. Yeah. Yeah, well, they were great sets. Oh my gosh. So you had talked about in February immigration issues really coming to a head and to the fore. And at that point, because uh, I'm the executive director of Progressives for Immigration Reform, where we kind of educate on the unintended consequences of unbridled immigration. And we had built at that time an H-1B visa database to look into how employment visas are being abused to displace U.S. tech workers. And uh, we- I, yeah, I, started, I lived through that, yeah. You, oh, great. We're gonna have to have more conversations about that down the road. But we had launched our H-1B database and U.S. tech workers in that window and it did very well for us so that's just cool one of the many examples and and then i'm also stacking silver as you seem to recommend in your alter report so it's starting to pay off a little bit now it'll do so uh, much more in the future as we move forward yeah unfortunately we're we're kind of like uh, uh there now in that time frame for the convergence of um forces that are economic going one way, forces that are fiscal going another, and demographics <laughs> going off on a third. So it's going to be very chaotic for two years at least. Yeah, it's an interesting way to look at that because there are, is a fiscal view, there's a monetary view, and then there's the demographics. How, you know, how old are people? Where is where's that peak buying group right now? And it all seems to be, like you said, it's, uh, it's really out of whack. There's also the other issue of um, uh, the convergence of forces over time. And in technical terms, uh, way back in the day, like in the 70s and 80s, people in computers and myself, I came into computers through the phone business. I mean, I was actually, I actually had my first uh, PC when I was 79 in 1979 oh. at, at a K Pro 2, <laughs> 2K, 2K of RAM. <laughs> and, I remember and, 14K was big. <laughs> oh man, you were cooking there, yeah. Um, it, it came in a, a metal case that was like um, uh, a sewing machine. <laughs> and his keyboard right. popped out, you know, whole deal. Anyway though, um, so, but there was convergence, the idea of convergence, that at some point, because we were talking about it in the early 80s, I was working deep in the phone companies, and we were all talking about the idea when computers and phones would merge in this convergence. And that was the, the holy grail we were working for through the 80s and the 90s. And it's been achieved with, you know, mm -hmm. the cell phones and the whole deal, and uh, the mass amount of computing power there. We have other levels of convergence now that are... Mm, uh, uh, more organic in the sense that universe seems to be trying to converge certain forces at certain time at this time uh, to produce uh, other effects 
and the and the wide ranging unintended or unforeseen consequences of this are just going to be uh, mind blowing for decades and decades. But the convergence is um, uh, cryptocurrencies, which is the next you know software. Okay, so uh, so we had the platform, we had PCs, we had mm -hmm. the computing power of all kinds, and we moved the computing power to mobile, <clears throat> and then we gave every person on the planet the same computing power. But it doesn't mean much without software. And so slowly, in that period of time that we were building out the hardware infrastructure, software has been out there eating the world uh, like Pac-Man eating those little dots, right? Mm -hmm. And so the very first example we saw of it in terms of both the technical implications, the demographic implications, the um, uh, human health and safety implications, and the employment Im implications was the displacement of the air traffic controllers. And the, right, uh, under Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Yes. Correct. Okay, that was uh, really that, the that, first. that really shook the labor markets because that was the first time because typically labor won. Um, and KMO had something. We were talking just last week about uh, exploitation now has moved to irrelevance. Where hey, let me jump in here for just a second. Sure. Uh, first, Cliff, I have been watching your stuff on screen for the past couple of days now, so it's uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> you poor bastard, you poor bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no, it's been great because I've been listening to the the Antarctica stuff and the stuff mm. about the uh, the Numo and the Anunnaki. Yeah, and, uh, it it really maps on to things that I had in the back of my head as I was creating this comic strip, which was uh, the writings of H. P. Lovecraft, particularly the later stuff like at, at the Mountains of Madness. Because he talks about warring factions of uh, extraterrestrials who have been on Earth for a very long time and who were involved in the creation and the manipulation of, uh, of humans. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's like, uh, I've got a friend of mine, Dick Allgaier, the remote viewer, and he says, no matter where you go, them fucking aliens. <laughs> <laughs> but what Kevin was talking about just now, I think uh, we were discussing a book that I've been reading by Yuval Noah Harari. It's called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And uh, in it, he's talking about how the information technology revolution is not just an information technology, but it's a concurrent revolution and sort of conjoined revolutions in information technology and neuroscience, such that big data is being coupled with uh, increasingly sophisticated understanding of human psychology. And uh, really, our free will is, is revealing itself more and more to be uh, largely ephemeral, you know, largely a, an illusion that we, we cling to. But uh, I would buy the word illusion. I wouldn't buy the word ephemeral because we make that free will solid in everything we do. And I would, I would agree with the guy's premise up to the point where he says that we have a, a greater understanding at a psychological level. We've got more minutia. We've taken that data and we've sliced it finer. It doesn't necessarily mean we have made intelligence out of that, that information, right? I, I personally dispute that psychology and psychiatry have advanced anything in the last, oh, 30 to 50 years um, of note. And other than this reductionism approach that you see throughout the rest of science, which reductionism is fine, but you know you can go to people and you can tell them, well, you know you can't do that with a um, uh, computer, and they say, well, why not? And you say, well, that number can't be represented in a binary fashion, and they go, what? You know, because there's there's huge uh, assumptions about our technology that are not valid, and we can't map the world 100% to digital. The universe is having us do a lot of shit there in terms of moving everything into a digital world and software is eating the world. And now it's with the AI, it's eating all these other uh, occupation levels that we used to, to have, but, and it is making, indeed, it is making exploitation an, an irrelevant factor in our lives. It's also um, uh, Bitcoin Ben, this YouTube personality that's kind of cool, has this idea of the grand global labor market, okay? And, and he's quite correct. In a world without borders, um, you know, um, communication borders, then the labor market is effectively global. And what does that do? Well, I hearken back to 1982 or whenever it was that Buckminster Fuller started uh, really pumping on the idea of a universal uh, two things. He had two things that would solve all the world's problems, which I agree. If we'd worked on implementing them at that time, it certainly would have done it. Now they've been superseded by technology, but we can still accomplish the same thing. His idea was that we should run an electrical transmission line around the entire coastline of all of the continents joined together. So the whole world would be electrified at the same level, and then it wouldn't matter 
where you were, the cheapest level of electricity would be flowing, right? And so it'd be the first grand global electrical market that would be fair because the transmission lines would be around the entire coastline. Why the coastline? Well, because 80% of the world's population lives within 100 miles of the coast, and it's easy to do that 100-mile drop, but it's really hard to run DC lines, you know, uh, across Kansas to reach into Colorado, that kind of thing for, for a small population. Sure. I remember when I had uh, wind energy clients and I would go to these conferences, uh, they would talk about how to build out the infrastructure to get the energy, the electricity from where the wind is to where it is needed. It'd be about 1.5 trillion is what they'd have to invest in that infrastructure. Because they'd have to, like you said, push it from the Rockies over to the coastal areas and things like that. Right. Now, though, uh, and then also the other thing he said that we should do is to set a global machinist wage. And that his idea was that we would have a standard uh, test that a machinist, uh, you know, a person who made things with me in a machine shop uh, could take. And if they passed that test, that would be like a, a base journeyman level. And, and everything else would piggyback off of that because Buckminster Fuller's analyses mm -hmm. of the labor policies of the uh, 1900s all the way up from 1900 all the way into the World War II showed that basically everything was in terms of the actual labor market was based on the uh, labor of a machinist. Now we've shifted, mm. right? Because machinists are now going to become irrelevant and you should probably look for something that's in the um, knowledge engineering business as your base level um, upon which you make a global salary scale, right? That, that's interesting. I was reading a book called Progressive Protectionism, and he talked about, you know, an Apple phone being made in China, one of five other countries. You're only talking about $20 in cost. And when he said, where does the other $200 come from? It's all software and IP. And when I was a kid, I was taught that 76% of every product is labor. But that must be way down now, which kind of just shows you the state labor is in. And also throw in robotics. Yes. You know, that, that's something I'm going to be going into is AI and uh, robotics just because I want to, um, uh, I want to have the, the technology here to assist me on my little place, right? And it's a very intriguing technology for me because I can code and I understand how this sort of stuff works. But five years from now, we will be living in a world in which there is no labor market. Would you actually have robotic servants at your house going around like- Oh, no, 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 you mean trying to repli <laughs> replicate humans like uh, Asimo and some of those? Mm -hmm. no, 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 by robotics and AI, I mean, I'm gonna have a smart greenhouse. It'll be able to adjust the uh, out outdoor light levels and maintain the lights constant on my plants and that kind of thing. Well, people have a um, misunderstanding about artificial intelligence, okay? Because artificial hmm. intelligence is really dumb. It's, it's computer code being executed one uh, segment at a time within assembly language, no matter how you cut it. That's all it is. There's no, no, no awareness of itself. It doesn't know what its next instruction it's going to execute or any of this. And so it's entirely um, uh, uh, driven that way. Plus, when they say deep learning, what they're talking about is letting a piece of software go and analyze other software. There's a fatal flaw in this, though. The people that are writing all this deep learning code, obviously, they need something to test their software against, right? And right. so they will, they will create a test bed, a sandbox, into which they will put what they think of as a representative sample of the real world that this AI is going to encounter. They will then let the AI loose and they'll tweak their neural network in terms of how it's absorbing the data and interacting with the other nodes in order to, to determine what it's actually learning. And then they'll get to some point where they say, uh, uh, we think that it's learned what it could have out of this sandbox. And then at some point they've validated this and they say, let it out in the real world. Well, the very first place that we've done this is been in the financial markets. And the right. AI- How goes that? Correct. Mm -hmm. And they've been, they, algos have been involved, AI algos have been involved in trading opportunities now for probably close to 12 years, if you want to look at it one way, one particular way of tight AI that's under the control of a single corporation within their machinery and so on, right? And it's failing miserably, all right? It's, it's lucky to get between 5 and 7% return on assets where their worst uh, human uh, analysts are getting eight to 13. But at the and same that, time, it does push out the, 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 the typical uh, broker because they, they're not fast enough 
uh, and the and the result of that has been the tremendous financial strain that these brokerage houses that used to provide a lot of analysis are under. Right. Here's what's going on. The the software engineer says, okay, here's my sandbox that I'm going to build this AI against. And I'm going to build its AI deep learning routine against the 99,000 data elements that are within that sandbox. Now, this is something I personally, just as an aside, I know about. I deal in data sets that are in the hundreds of millions of records. So I deal in big data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I understand some of the, the pitfalls of this. But they, they engineer this stuff. And... First off, their idea of mapping the real world conditions to a digital representation fails. It must fail. They cannot possibly replicate what that AI is going to encounter in as wide enough range within their sandbox that that AI would actually not stray out of that range in the real world. So, it so fails are you talking about, like, say, we're looking at a brokerage house. Let's say I'm doing commodities like uh, frozen concentrated orange juice. I look at weather patterns. I look at labor markets. You're saying AI may not be able to factor in all of these. No, 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 no. I'm saying it's looking at all of that stuff, but where you have this uh, intelligent filter, it simply has a, a vacuum. And the, a, the flaw in AI that is now proven, especially in financial markets, is that it is seeing stuff in the noise, calling it a pattern, Mm -hmm. acting on it as though that pattern is realistic and causing other unintended side effects within its own operations that then snow, snowballs off until that part of it has to be redirected back in. So AI's uh, failures are showing up in the fact that they've got to hire more people to keep the AI reined in and they're spending more time trying to keep it from seeing patterns in noise that really isn't there. And so when they, when they want to have uh, AI look at something and determine if a pattern is there, it's not like they take it out to a real world and, and say, look at this 1950s television signal and look at all of this noise and tell me if you can catch the um, uh, one signal we're going to allow to go through in some undetermined future from now. And, 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 and if you do that, you find out the AI is going to find 200,000 uh, signals to the one you let out simply because your software engineers could not in their minds put in parameters that would screen out its ability to find patterns within the noise. And so AI has a very fatal flaw. I trust AI to run the um, uh, lights at a street, right? I trust AI to make my dryer smarter that it knows when there's uh, less uh, water in the clothes and it doesn't have to put as much heat in there. I would at some point trust AI to guide a surgeon in, in dealing with internal problems. Mm -hmm. Am I going to trust AI to do anything like policy, like direction, like guidance? No, I don't think so. So it's kind of like Malcolm Gladwell wrote that book called Thin Slicing, or it was about thin slicing, where they talked about like a very skilled human being, like an art curator, was able to just, their gut told them that this is a forgery. They couldn't like specifically say this, this, or this, but their gut, and they ended up being right. And we apply that. Skilled human beings seem to be able to apply that all the time. We can't help it, okay? And it's because our, and they're actually trying. Intel has a project going where they've tried to redesign the computer chip. Instead of using the, what's known as the primary ring or the ring zero or the single point register approach that's been in domination all this time in computer chips and PCs, they're trying this thing that's like, um, it, it sort of replicates what goes on in our brains with our own little neural uh, connections, right? And so they're, these chips are amazing, but they're also only about 30 to 40% effective and they're very expensive and they're hard to program for and so on. So there's levels of stuff that are going on within humans, that is to say consciousness. And so intuition can't be okay. modeled. Right, this kind of stuff. And, and this is something I know about because I used to write what was called expert systems uh, under contract for people uh, in Prologue, which was one of the first artificial intelligence languages out there. And it's really unique because it's a, um, a compiled interpreted program, uh, programming language and can be used to alter itself as it's running. Very few programming languages can do that. And pure Prologue doesn't loop, it goes back and forth, back and forth, and re uses recursion, very much like the human mind does. So you can write some very interesting programs. But uh, again, they're limited to what I could extract. So if I went to a, um, uh, uh, okay, so I worked for this thing called the, the Federal Base Expectancy Study. 
And the idea was that you could hand to a parole board uh, a piece of software that would examine a, a man's life in and out of prison and tell you at that point if he was a good subject for parole. And so some analyst somewhere had come up with these rules, the AI, the algos that said, if murderer, better parole chance than car thief. Which is true, which is true, okay? Most murderers- Less chance of recidivism. Correct, correct. <laughs> most car thieves are back in right away. Most murderers stay out a little longer, right? And so, so, but there was only 325 elements that we had to extract from a person's life in order to model that person's life within the, uh, the, the software. And so it was making decisions on 325 data points at a maximum, and many of those we never had. Uh, we went back to 1912, we analyzed all the prison records in the state of Washington from 1912 forward and tried to extract these 325 elements for each and every one of these, these prisoners. And, and I contend it was a very worthwhile effort and it provided good intelligence to someone sitting there at a parole hearing uh, to understand that you're talking to somebody that's likely to uh, go back in because he was a car thief, he's a professional car thief, et cetera, et cetera. And that the murderer you're talking to, it was a crime of passion, his brain was twisted and it's likely not to happen again, that kind of thing, right? So, um, so it, makes, it makes for good intelligence, but would I allow a computer to sit there and accept the, the stuff coming from these people and then apply these 325 points to that, it, it doesn't make sense. So what is, you know, when you look at the future, uh, because you, you've, uh, many times you've talked about, you know, the, the, these technological revolutions that are coming, but then you also talk about space technologies. And then we also talk about woo-woo. Where, what, where are the, where are humans going? What's, from inside us and what's coming from outside us? What, where are we, we don't, going? We don't, okay, we don't know since 1947 is my contention, okay? Prior to 1947, technology in, in my line of work, that is to say information technology, was um, uh, headed one way with vacuum tubes. Mm -hmm. We were doing phenomenal things with vacuum tubes. Uh, there were several people that had already achieved free energy with vacuum tubes. There was one guy that was doing an implosion um, machines with vacuum tubes, controlled by vacuum tubes. And so, and then in 1947, boom, digital from that point on. Vacuum tube technology has died off to the point where uh, you've either got to make your own or employ one of the two or three specialists in the country to make them for you. Okay, it's interesting. It's interesting you say that. My father was a flight engineer with Transworld Airlines for 30 years. and He got on when they were flying those prop, the Constellation prop planes. I've flown on those. Oh, okay. So you know. Uh, yeah. And he I scared said, the hell out of you. <laughs> yeah. And he said he thought he'd retire on that. He ended up retiring on the 747. Hmm. But, you know, it just goes to show somewhere there was a big divergence. In the right. Power. They shot down. Okay. They used analog radar. This is, this is a loose sketch of history as Cliff sees it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1940s, well, throughout 1940s, we got really good with analog radar. They were working on radar that had this double skip componentry where it could actually skip around the horizon and bring back really quality signals. Hmm. And, and um, uh, they, they also discovered that the radar that they were using, if tweaked a certain way, could actually become a, uh, a military force. And they were playing around with this stuff and they deliberately shot down those ships near Roswell, okay? They knew they were there. They'd been hassled by them. The, the nuclear place there was attracting them. They, 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 um, army test unit that was running those radar was moved from its base down to Roswell and set up over those months and they shot these buggers down. Um, and then from that point on, we started getting into the stuff that we discovered in there. We discovered fiber optics. We discovered digital technology, microchips. Uh, we discovered software we didn't understand. We discovered biometrics uh, and other stuff that has been put into our society, the things that they're not putting in at this point is basically the, the propulsion system and anti-gravity or the electrogravitics, okay? We also discovered that we were on the right track with vacuum tubes because vacuum tubes lead you to think about the universe in a certain way, in a way that is not as the academics in, in the world describe it to us now. So uh, in a vacuum tube world, you know that the sun is not a nuclear reactor, it's a plasma electrical 
uh, effect or electrical now, plasma how, effect. How or why is that, Cliff? Okay, because in order to do vacuum tubes correctly, and we were doing vacuum tubes in which we were putting radioactive materials in them and all different <laughs> kinds of stuff, right? And, and you wouldn't believe the boost you can get, tenfold boost in um, uh, ham wavelength uh, propagation ability with just the little tiniest bit of radioactive iodine in there, okay? As a nodule that's been uh, um, uh, put in with some iron. And it literally sits on the floor of the, of the vacuum tube. Now, true, we're talking, you know, a good-sized vacuum tube, so it's easy to do and stuff. But it, it means you think about the world in an electrical fashion, okay, just as Oppenheimer gotcha. did, mm -hmm. okay? And so you don't think about it as a nuclear kind of um, a force issue, okay? So, so it's, um, uh, let's look at a, real quickly at an at a atom bomb explosion. In that, we take plutonium and we rip the plutonium apart, in essence, and from that, that release is a giant amount of radiation and energy that comes out. It's not nuclear, it's electrical, because what we're actually doing is we're not pulverizing any of the electrons or neutrons or anything in the plutonium. We are, we are forcefully separating the electrons from the neutrons in a chaotic and uncontrolled fashion. Okay, that's what a nuclear explosion is. It's actually a giant electrical explosion. And so the people that said that the sun is a huge mass of hydrogen that has been squished down and is radiating because it's been squished down by this giant gravity don't have the imagination to understand that it's actually an electrical force caused by the nature of a very solid sun going through uh, physical material that provides friction at a level we cannot imagine and in ionized gas. So mm -hmm. it's just like my TIG torch, my tungsten uh -huh. ionized gas uh -huh. torch. It's exactly the same thing. And, it, and you get a little ball on the end of your torch and it looks like the sun. It's got a little corona and that's what you use to melt all the other metals. And so if we had done this correctly and continued on the, um, the path of, of vacuum tubes, we wouldn't have a lot of the academic uh, structures that we have now. It was convenient in 1947 to not correct those uh, misunderstandings because once we went to digital, it didn't matter so much that the technology kept pointing us Right, because we had had an alien technology that looked far superior, so we just let that... And it was cheaper. It was vastly cheaper. Okay, it was no matter what we did, uh, we could never, ever, ever reduce a vacuum tube down to the, to the cheapness of, of production of any of the, the microcircuitry. The reason that this is because it was a mechanical process where you had to Form you have the glass, the, the, you had, to, had to solder stuff, wires, and all kinds of stuff, right? And so you actually had to manufacture and put it together. Here we can design machines that will stamp these things out for us. Uh, and thus we get into the same level of technology that used to exist on this planet. So quick little deviation over to the Southern Caucasus Mountains. I don't know which country is claiming the region at the moment. I don't know if it's- um, Like South Ossetia, that area? Out in that area, right. You, you, the big yes. valleys there, yes. right. Mm -hmm. Okay, in those valleys, uh, the Russians had discovered um, through um, aerial mapping, these things underneath the, the farmer's fields that made no sense. And so they went and dug them up in, uh, I think it was like uh, 40, 45 or 46 or 47, somewhere in there, okay, right at the tail end of World War II. They were factories. Uh, these were giant factories that were apparently robotized. There was nothing left of the, of the factory other than the, the peripheral uh, uh, foundation of it. It was a cement we cannot replicate, something mm. that they're, they're still working on. And, and it was just pristine, the foundations and stuff. What was built on there had all rusted away. There's vast amounts of iron that was triggering their magnetometers and steel that had rusted away. But the, the real neat part of this is that right next to each of these two large uh, factory facilities, we're talking giant, but there was only, literally it was like a cartoon factory in the sense there was one big door at one end and uh, outlets at the other end. And they could tell that one was an outlet and one was inlet in, in the Russians in terms of their analysis. And so they came to the conclusion that these were robotized and they were basically just dumping raw materials in, in at one end and getting the finished goods out at the other end. The finished goods out of this contained within them um, crystals that had had microfine wire. Some of the wire, uh, the wire was of various different uh, metallurgical alloys. Some of those metallurgical alloys uh, had minute traces of silver and gold in them. 
They were wrapped around the crystals. And what we found, what the Russians found, was huge piles of rejects, huh. of, of cracked crystals of, that didn't pass the, the quality control. So we know that they were producing something that today resembles um, some of the circuitry we see within uh, complex control circuits, like, um, uh, uh, like we would produce now for your phone a device that sensed temperature and it's basically doing it by the conductivity around a little micro piece of crystal. And here, here were areas where the, in the one factory, it was estimated that there were, were 100 tons of recoverable debris. Oh so, that, so who knows how long it ran in order to produce that much waste. See, so, so we're just replicating what has already been on the, this planet in the past. But we can, we can make this assumption that our world from 1947 he was, here was humans, we were doing our stuff, we may have been visited by aliens, we may have been created by aliens, but we had no real, um, there was no there there, right? It was just a bunch of stories, a bunch of fears, a bunch of myths and so on. And then as of 1947, we got stuff. And so off we go. Interesting. So you, you absolutely you subscribe to the view that there are extraterrestrial life forms that either are visiting us or had certainly visited us in the past. I know that they've done it in the past. I don't see any reason why they would not be attracted to visiting us now. Mm -hmm. And if we did knock down one of their ships, is it possible that some of the things that we see in the sky that we call UFOs, we've manufactured? Exactly, because I've seen one of those, okay? I know I've seen this. I've, I saw it in Olympia. It was 1971. Uh, um, uh, it was out on Johnson's Point Road. It was uh, very late at night. I was headed to, yeah, by very late at night, I mean, it was dark. And it was a time of no moon. Uh, I was uh, headed in a Volkswagen van with some other people over to a, a dinner party. We came up to this particular point in Johnson Point Road ahead of the Gowers airfield that was off to the side, right at the top of the hill, and the van died. And it was like, you know, we're all pissed. We'd gone out to pick up this guy many miles. Johnson Point Road is this long road. And so we were trying to get back into town. And so we got out to look at the van. At first, we're, you know, monkeying around. The lights still worked, but there was no other electrical function in the engine and stuff. And it was at that point that, that we opened up the van door. You know how you do on those old vans. Looked out and, hey, there's no stars over us. And that you couldn't see any stars for about a mile um, into the east, into Olympia, and for about a half a mile to the, to the west. So this thing was huge. Wow. Uh, in terms of its view of Now, you have to understand something, though. This is not like standing on a, on a hill. This is like standing in a road that's been cut through 200-foot-high trees, okay? So, okay. So, your, so your view is obscured anyway. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. not saying that this thing was a mile long. It's just saying that it was low enough that you couldn't look up underneath it and see anything except maybe a mile out. It looked like a big void. <laughs> well, and there's something else. <clears throat> it was low enough that... Uh, when one of the guys that I was with in the van got out and, and had a flashlight and aimed it up, you could see the reflection of the light off of something metallic at the top of the trees. These trees had been logged maybe 60 years ago or so. They were probably 30-year-old, uh, uh, 180-foot-high uh, maximally thin firs, and they were swaying at the top. Uh, and it was, in a, it was in the spring and there was no other wind. They were swaying in the top as, uh, underneath this thing. So there was a physical thing there and it had lights on it. It may have been triangular, but I couldn't tell because I was in that little cut in a row, mm -hmm. right? But it didn't behave like some of the spaceships I've seen with the 3D goggles that I say, hey, human spaceships don't, don't react that way. So I've got these 3D goggles on, uh, thir third generation night vision, uh, 3G, okay? And uh, uh, they see well out to about 145 miles out from the surface of the planet. They see especially well in the hour and a half beyond um, sunset or the hour and a half ahead of sunrise because of the angle of light coming up <coughs> from the sun reflecting off of the things you're looking at. And the and, military call that early EENT, early evening nautical twilight, before morning nautical twilight. Right. Correct. And it's just so pristine for seeing stuff because you don't have any of the light coming down into your, into your goggles per se. It's just reflecting off of stuff. And so one day I'm out there, it was probably, um, it was before, it was like four in the morning or so, before sunrise. Okay. And it was in, a, again, it was in the spring. It was more recent here. This would have been 
oh, maybe five or six or seven years ago, something like that. And uh, I'm looking out and I, and I see the little triangle things flying around. That's not unusual. I usually would center up on Cassiopeia, the constellation, mm -hmm. and, and then range out from there. You got to be careful because you're doing this on a deck. You've got these, you're looking up, you can fall off into the fish pond, that kind of thing, yeah. right? So, uh, so, so I'm looking up and I see these, uh, I would see, sometimes I would see uh, squadrons of these little triangle things, obviously doing training exercises relative to each other. Uh, being a military brat, seeing mm -hmm. you know, field training all the time, I recognize it when I see it. And, um, and then I saw these things just scatter. Never seen anything like that before. Had no idea what was going on. And then uh, something attracted, a flash attracted my attention slightly off of um, uh, Cassiopeia. There was a, um, a, a setting moon um, in the uh, southwest at that point from my position, but it wasn't interfering with my vision at all. And there'd just been some kind of peripheral flash of light. Now, the tube on the third generation goggles doesn't have much of a peripheral vision, but it was a reflection of light that came into the tube. So I turned my head that way in time to catch the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my, in my life. There was a shining, could have been metallic, I couldn't tell, but it was a very finely defined teardrop shape object with a blunt uh, end and a very fine end. And some distance ahead of that object, or what I thought of as a head of that object was a circular ring of light that seemed to be from my night vision goggles, like um, it looked very much like a round flashlight being shine, shined onto uh, an old style movie, outdoor movie theater, which would reflect back very finely wherever the light was and then sort of a little haze around it. And then poof, the ship jumps into the light and they both disappear, just <laughs> gone. And I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you like, know, holy shit, holy shit. Something? <laughs> it, well, no, just a new way of moving that humans don't think about because half, not even a, I mean, a millisecond later, there it is over there, like having moved mm, 10 degrees of arc across the sky in, in a millisecond or two. And there's the ship. And then, it, then all of a sudden, there's that thing of light and it jumps into the, the light again and it's gone and there it is again way the hell down there another 10 or 12 degrees of arc and within a second it had transversed the entire arc of the visible sky and left our area and then maybe two or three seconds after that the ships came back hey cliff yeah let me have you back up to the uh, you've move from one sighting story sure. to another. Let me have you go sure. back to the first one. You sure. brought that up in the context of, you know that that object you saw was a human reproduction or a human use of alien technology. How do you know it wasn't alien? Okay, I suspect strongly that it was human um, because it looked like it was having trouble and because it was emitting um, disturbances in the atmosphere that we could sort of smell. And, and to be honest, it smelled like a bunch of guys in a truck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say there was like sewer smells or anything, but there was like body odor out of it, right? And it was a couple of hundred feet up of, over us. It was not that high off of the, the, um, the trees. Uh, we didn't stick around for it to leave, just as we, the, there were females with us and everybody started getting afraid. And, um, and so we decided we'd push the van and go down this long hill. And at that point, the van, once we were out underneath its influence, the van turned on and was quite happy to proceed. And we drove on into town. But as we did that, it had taken off towards Fort Lewis. Now, um, so, uh, you know, and, and I thought I could see like rivets. I thought I could see, um, you know, mechanical stuff on the bottom where, the, where there was, it didn't look like air vents per se, but it did look like there was this area that the air was coming out of. And, and it, it looked, um, I, I, you know, I mean, it, this is years later, uh, but it looked damaged, not quite healthy. Mm. You know, like there was a grate out of alignment or something made me think, oh, well, that's, that's, not, that's not good. What do you think of Whitley Strieber's uh, accounts of his, his abduction experiences? Uh, abduction experiences are fine. I can't say yay or nay about anything that anybody um, has popped off on this, except that I don't see any new knowledge there that, that, I, can, that I can use. Well, if I ask because when you mentioned the smell, 
uh, one of the details from Whitley Strieber's account, and a lot of the, you know, the alien abduction lore that I'm sort of basing the comic off of is, is extracted from Strieber and Bud Hopkins and, you know, and that crew. Uh, but the interior of the, uh, the aliens, maybe it was a craft, maybe it was a base somewhere, but, you know, wherever they took him, it was filthy. He described it as being really dirty and seemingly unsanitary and possibly like um, Travis Walton and the ship that took him. You know, yes. just grungy beyond belief. This this wasn't that kind of a smell, okay? I've lived on military bases all my life. This smelled like, you know, uh, a barracks first thing in the morning. Hmm. <laughs> Bunch of sweaty dudes, huh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And see, the, the, the thing is that about abduction experiences, right? Uh, I've had missing time. I can't make sense of it. This was subsequent to the encountering these, these things. Maybe it was, you know, the military came on in and wanted to scrub my mind. Who the hell knows? I don't know what, what it was. I just, all I know is that I had this missing time experience. So I'm not going to claim anybody else is saying, uh, is, is uh, spouting bullshit about an abduction experience if there's no evidence or anything. And, and uh, you know, uh, I'd be quite happy to talk to them and so on, not really waste my time about it. But uh, there's, I have yet to encounter an abductee that can give me good, solid information I can use, right? That I could use to do something to cause, basically to cause problems somewhere, right? <laughs> uh, so, so a guy gets abducted and he says, um, uh, blah, blah, blah about the ship. If he could bring back, you know, some kind of solid information that would else aid us in building such a ship or shooting one down, hey, obviously solid, you know, even though we don't have any evidence from him, his mind brought some back. Uh, it'd be better if we could get somebody that gets abducted, you know, that could like pilfer something on the way back, right? So they would actually have some technology, that kind of stuff we don't have now. But intelligence um, uh, uh, learned and transmitted by consciousness would be fine, and we just don't see a lot of that. In fact, I haven't seen any of it that, that's held up. And I, I examine this stuff, like this um, Keisha guy out of uh, Iran, uh, the Persian, right? With his free energy that was supposedly downloaded from space aliens. And it's a waste of time. It's like Bashar with his uh, technology supposedly given to him by space aliens. It's a waste of time. All of these things are, are wasting my time. I'm getting old. I'm getting really pissed about my time getting wasted. So I have a tendency to brush them off unless they're ponying up with something right away because I'm a practical guy and I want that, that anti-gravity RV. How about the... Um, uh... Gamble is his last name. He and his wife, they have the Thrive Movement. They had a movie a while back. Uh, I've been feuding with him for a long time. Yeah? <laughs> I, I pissed him off right away. Um, the, uh, personally, I think a lot of the decisions he made were really stupid. He, you know, so he comes on out there and says, well, you know, uh, I put five million or so, some number of millions into this movie. I, I put my house on the line and I, you know, damn near bankrupted myself for it. And my response is, well, then you're one dumb motherfucker to put your, your family's livelihood at risk for some wild ass piece of shit that you're not sure is going to do what you want. And, you know, he's a nice enough guy, I'm sure. Um, uh, you know, I mean, he exhibits that, but he's got to understand he's coming in with a, at least into, you know, schizos like myself with a, uh, a weighted against him just because of his family connections. And so he's got a, it's just like um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Here you've got to have, you know, um, a position from somebody whose family is like that saying, well, now I'm with the good guys. It's like, all right, dude, come on in, but we're keeping our eye on you. What about the specifics of the uh, toroidal energy and the zero point energy and his claim that lots of human scientists have created these free energy devices, but some malevolent force or organization is suppressing the research? That's accurate. We that know accurate. We, that is accurate. We know this all the way back to Keeley. Okay, so back in the early 1800s, there was this really cool guy who was working on um, uh, mechanical systems that worked off of an implosion technique that required that involved um, hydrodynamics of a very interesting and unique fashion using either water or air. Air being a nice fluid, if you want to use it, involved no electricity. He could build these things. If they were not perpetual motion, but they returned more energy in a significant fashion than what was put in. He built them large enough to power trains, to power locomotives. There's records of him and, and his crew doing uh, 40 and 60 and 80 mile runs back and forth on this 20 mile track, testing the, these devices out. Uh, on his death, they were swooped up. Smithsonian, 
you know, that's, that's my evil force, right, is the name of the evil force, because the Smithsonian locks up Tesla, they lock up all of this. Tesla had an anti-gravity uh, floating device. Where do you hear about that anymore, right? And he had his proven, he had it remote controlled. Uh, you know, Amazon would pay him a bazillion dollars for these remote controlled drones that required no rotors and could be accurately steered even to altitude. So he had a three-dimensional GPS system. So not only did it know lat long, but it knew how high it was above the ambient, or above the local topology, based on electrical uh, impulses, because you can you, you you can easily devise even an analog device that will tell the difference between radar bounce through wet ground and radar off of dry sand or radar off of trees, this kind of thing, right? And so it was it was quite remarkable. And they were because of the nature of the analog, it was fail safe. The thing lifted up and floated, or it just floated, right? So, so it was not particularly a danger to anybody. That's all gone. So, so I agree that, that his premise that we're being manipulated by dark forces is quite accurate. Uh, I don't answer why questions as to why they want to keep us stupid um, or, or ignorant. Uh, there are some things that would seem to be obvious just from our guises. Because that is the natural question, why? Yeah, but see, why, here's, why, but yeah. it's a fallacy of an argument. It's, it's like if I, you ask somebody these things, and as, a, as somebody who's a conspiracy-minded paranoid that has the genetics to prove that paranoia, I've been asked all my life, well, why is this the case? And then instantly, they, the person that is asking you that question, they don't want to know your answer. They're using that in order to dismiss your argument because you don't know the person's intent or the why on the other side. So decades ago, I said, I don't know the why. I don't answer for someone else's intent. I can barely figure out my own intent most days, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not going to presume to uh, uh, impose my idea of what your intent is on any action. So as a, as a real psychologist, I would examine that behavior and make conclusions off of it affecting my life. But I'm not going to try and put them back on an interpretation of what I think your brain's doing. So right. and the same thing would be <laughs> I'm these sorry, bad guys. I would say the same thing is true in organizations and bad guys where you have a level of, 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 um, uh, of thinking that, that um, I'm not usually able to participate in. Okay, so let me cl clarify that. Uh, I am truly a schizophrenic uh, relative, okay? My brother was a schizophrenic. That makes me a schizotypical. Mm -hmm. I have genetics for that. People don't understand when I say I'm a paranoid that I cannot help but think certain ways. That also means I can't think other ways. So I'm not a guy you want in meetings. Microsoft mm -hmm. would send me to meetings when I worked for their <laughs> consulting services just to find out what the fuck was really going on because I, don't, I love contention. Uh, uh, I love a good fight. I'm not willing to back down. Um, and I have a tendency to stir people up in a way that um, uh, was beneficial for them. And what a lot of us people didn't recognize is that schizophrenics and schizotypicals, we emit stuff in our sweat that makes people nervous. This is why schizophrenics are always thrown out of villages. They're always thrown out of towns and stuff. You cannot stand to live around them unless you're a schizotypical because the, the, st the pheromones that come off in their sweat uh, from the adrenochrome, drive uh, non-schizophrenic uh, people uh, crazy to some degree. It makes them nervous and anxious and stuff. Interesting. Right, right. And so, and so I would go on into these rooms and I would emit natural pheromones and, you know, <laughs> shit happened and I'd get paid. So, so it was all good, you know. <laughs> hey, Kevin? Mm. Yes. You've got some images queued up from uh, the yeah. comic. I'll Ooh. go ahead and pull those up. I'll share the screen. Oh. I'd like to say a few things about those and, and get Cliff to riff on some of these themes. Like uh, one of the primary themes of the comic strip is that uh, the aliens who are, the gray aliens are basically uh, bio robots. They're not really sentient entities under themselves. They're there's a lot of different aliens on earth and they use the grays as their interaction with humans, you know, as their interface with humans. So that there, it seems to humanity like there is basically one species of, uh, of alien really there are many and the grays are not they're right, not really look, look, I'll they're pull up a I'll pull up a gray there's a gray can no, you that's... oh gray's in the back huh. I'm not oh, saying that one I see a, um, uh, ant -like oh. Being oh, a oh let me go ahead pull that down because I have two open at the same time and it looks like I can only have one maybe yeah. do you still see the ant I yeah. see VZ and Ed yeah okay let me uh, change out then uh, I think what it is, I need to share my screen top. 
And I think most people know what a gray is. Though. I mean, I'd love yeah, to have the, sure. the image up, but uh, yeah. the, the okay. premise of the strip is sure. that the, the aliens who are basically our heroes, you know, the, the title, the, the featured characters, the point of view characters, they don't know what's going on really any more than anybody else does, any more than any human does. I mean, they're just doing their jobs. Their jobs are ridiculous. They think of them as being ridiculous. <laughs> They, sure, sure. Yeah. They're trapped in this silliness. They, they're the bureaucrats. Word. That's kind of, you know, the, the, the name Geb, it is uh, Maria Cuervo, who's a PhD in philosophy here in our office. She kind of threw that out because uh, it's, it's an allusion to an ancient Egyptian god of the earth. But for our aliens and for us, it's, you know, the Greater Earth Betterment Bureau that kind of speaks to that bureaucratic element in there. But the Greater Earth Betterment Bureau is a, a secret society within the a alien organization. They really do want to help. The Geb folks want to help, but uh, they're not allowed to. So everything they do, they have to do under the radar. But as of yet, that, that hasn't been introduced into the comic at all. The characters are just distracting themselves from their meaningless lives and their meaningless jobs with food and drugs and popular entertainment and video games and... You know, yeah, sure. I've worked in that work. office. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, KMO and Cliff, can you see the comic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's the gray in the background smoking a cigarette. Looks like yeah. he's got some coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'll bring he, up a... a how he's about? the old gray. He's a little different from the others because he hangs around. The others are very um, disposable and temporary. You know, they, they run down after two or three months and have to be recycled. And this guy right. has been just sitting in the, the mess hall, smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee for decades now. And nobody really knows <laughs> where he's from or what he right. does. Right. That's well, kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Um, at least you didn't fall into the um, uh, trap with your insects or your other aliens, for that matter, of making them look like um, bodybuilders or MMA kind of guys, right? Um, I've been having some battles with people about uh, alien and morphology. And, you know, uh, oh, scary reptilians or scary um, uh, uh, insect beings. And it's like, well, wait a second, guys. Reptilians don't have shoulder mass the way humans do because we have our shoulder mass due to climbing and, and, and swimming kind of activities that whoever wanted to create us uh, knew we were going to be doing, right? And reptilians have their their uh, shoulders and stuff in an in a entirely different structure in their, in their limbs in the front of them. They don't have side action that they can do. And so they're not gonna develop the big scary muscle mass, the, the lats, the traps, and the biceps and all of that. And so a true alien is gonna exhibit some of these things that are gonna make them look extremely odd in our, in our uh, viewpoint. And you guys know- um, yeah. And I think KMO's done a really good job of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there is didn't. there is one that she's kind of the enforcer of the group. She's kind of buff, but other than that, and she seems to take you know great pleasure in dealing out pain. But other than that, they're yeah they're kind of unusual. <laughs> and you know, there's the thing too about um, uh, how would aliens behave, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, and this sort of thing. So um, uh, I've done a lot of psychedelics and I've talked to aliens. Uh, people will say, oh, it's a hallucination. And I say, no, hallucinations are entirely different. Hallucinations are a structured thing as part of the psychedelic technology that you go through before you reach the other worlds. I'm talking psychedelics at a shamanic level, not mm -hmm. you know for a rave or something. And uh, when you do this, you get to talk with the other. And when you're speaking with them, you know you're, just, you're actually interacting with a mind that is not human and it, it interacts differently. And there, I have discussed things in different ways with different kinds of beings under different circumstances. Um, it is a, a, a hellacious thing, breaking through the uh, consciousness barriers using psychedelics as a technology, and many people uh, fail to recover from that. Okay, so I'm not recommending this to people, uh, but it is possible done um, uh, uh, with, with a certain attitude and so on. Anyway, when you talk to these individuals, you find that the morphology of their bodies impacts their thinking. And hmm. so I, I have talked, I have discussed a, a great deal of things with uh, beings that we could describe as mantids. Um, and these mantids are very interesting. They are emotionally, they were the ones that taught me uh, a lot of the stuff about the uh, that I incorporated later on into the emotional reduction engine, how you can get, how you, 
tease emotion levels out of words, especially in context, right? Mm -hmm. We do this continuously. If we couldn't do this, the world, we'd kill it we'd all kill each other and there wouldn't be the life here. So we're very good at teasing out emotional nuances, some of us more so than others. The, the mantids in their, in their discussions with me, the, and there were other insectoids that are also the same way, uh, something I discovered. Uh, these beings never raise children. They have no concept of raising young. They're insects, they lay eggs, that's it. They don't ha interact with the eggs after that. They don't have a vagus nervous system. They cannot feel love. Love is entirely within the vagus nervous system, not your central nervous system, doesn't exist in your heart. It exists in the vagus nervous system, which connects all the major organs except for the adrenal glands. Um, the, uh, the mantids are, are, for their beings, compassionate, but they're compassionate without action. So they're going to have an emotion that we would say would be similar to, or similar to uh, uh, pity more than empathy because they can't empathize. Okay. okay. They, they, ha they have no siblings, so they can't say I could walk a mile in my brother's shoes. Right. And so, so they don't have a lot of this structure in the language and they so, find us so fascinating that, for them. So during the psychotropic experience, you're, ha you're having an out of body and leaving the body allows you then to communicate with these. Would you say that? Is what's going okay. If, if you want to think of it that way, that's accurate. Okay. Uh, because the body dissolves in the process and you die at an emotional level in the process of these uh, large psychotropic uh, journeys. But whenever I appeared in any of these places and discussed things with these beings, my mind would was housed in my body. But, uh, you know, now that we're discussing it, no, my, my physical body was back, back mm -hmm. where it left it. But I wasn't an amorphous blob kind of a thing, right? So, so you do have a have a body there, and you're aware of it. And these and the mantids were um, uh, very forthcoming. Uh, they also don't have the concept of lying. Okay, hmm. there's there's no need for they have the concept of 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 shielding, and they have a concept of misdirection but not lying as we understand it, where you would put out a lie and try and maintain that, right? You, you made would, me think of that movie Galaxy Quest, where the one group of- I love that. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they didn't believe that the, 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 the space show was a fictional work. They thought, how, of course it's real. Yeah, historical <laughs> records, right, right. Mm -hmm. But see, at least the mantids know that other beings are uh, capable of lying, even though the mantids themselves are not. And they understand that this is is capable uh, is done, and so they do have filters out for that. And they're they would actually make incredible researchers, but they're not motivated the way we are because they don't have hormones the way we are. So they could, they you could be a friend to one of these guys, and it could see you uh, being trampled by a rhino, and and you know by not even really worry about it one way or another, right? It was it was just outside of its, but it may or may not for its own purposes tell you that the rhino is about to hit you. But really interesting. So, so when you talk about aliens, they don't behave as humans. So when I, when I hear all of this stuff coming out of, you know, um, the blue chicken society, the blue chicken cult, uh, Corey Good and these guys, and uh, even, even most of Kerry uh, Cassidy's people in their description of their interaction with aliens, it's like they are uh, under one of two conditions is in existence here. They're either uh, lying to our, to them themselves and us, or their mind is placing a human filter over something that they saw in order to be able to determine and, and integrate it. Um, but they never speak of things that, you know, they, they, you just don't see them um, popping off in wonderment anywhere about how bizarre that being was because it, it, you know, it couldn't feel compassion or it couldn't feel love or, you know, something along these lines. And, uh, and a lot of the interactions that these, the uh, beings in the, or that the people that have alien abductions and this sort of thing that are reported in the popular media, a lot of those interactions end up devolving down to religion, you know? Okay. And it's like, it's like, okay, I, I've done a lot of tripping. I've talked to a lot of these beings and, and I would, and we would, Never, never did we discuss gods or any of that sort of stuff. It was entirely dismissive of any of that kind of uh, um, uh, predilection on the part of humans. The, when you meet these beings, it's all about, hey, we're glad that you got here. Damn, this is such cool technology. Let's, let's, let's trade. I'll tell you something of value. You tell me something of value. So I once trade, well, the mantids, right? 
Uh -huh. Okay, so I traded the idea of a surface protectant for structures for some stuff that they gave me about linguistics. And you say a surface protection, a protectant for structures because they were telling me about where they lived and the conditions that they lived under. And so it dawned on me, wow, you know, these insects didn't know the idea of paint. Oh. <laughs> so, so I sold them the concept of paint and they, they gave me stuff that I incorporated later on in my programming. Cliff, I've done quite a few psychedelics myself, not recently, but uh, heroic shamanic doses like the ones you're talking about. And I, for me, I have a lot of trouble holding on to the details of those encounters. Uh, they fade like dreams almost immediately when I come back. Uh, what's there's, okay, so, so um, there's a difference between the seven uh, guides, okay? There's a difference between psilocybin and, and mescaline. Um, there's a difference between the synthetics, LSD and all of those, and the naturals. And each of these is a slightly different technology. When you take mescaline is the, in my experience, that's the point, uh, or that's the technology for getting into mind to mind contact with these other beings. Mm -hmm. When I did that uh, one time, I met this, this guy on this, um, I mean, clearly male, he was, uh, nude with a sort of a little skirt thing on, uh, on the side of this weird lake. And this guy was very interesting. And I, I talked to him a couple of different, uh, expeditions, but he taught me a technique for bringing that back the first time that I did the mescaline with him. And thereafter, no worries, you know, even on psilocybin, I would remember this technique. This is where I was instructed the, um, the technique that they call the moat in your eye. There's a reason it's called that. I won't go into the reason because it betrays how to use that technique, but that's used with uh, what we might call microdosing, um, not tenth of a gram, but like one gram. And then there's a meditation, and then you can transit over. Okay, so um, uh, but there are techniques for doing this. All right, now I'm probably too old to be uh, jumping into large uh, psychedelic journeys and doing that sort of thing anymore uh, because of the 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 length of time it takes you to reintegrate all of the parts of your personality and and i'm doing stuff now and there's people de depending on on me so i just can't right. divert right but the techniques are easily instructed i just don't think that you can get them across unless you're you know actually both on that same wavelength on that same molecule make sense mm-hmm yeah. Okay, so, so now there's different techniques for the psilocybin versus the uh, mescaline, and you'll find that um, mescaline is slightly different than peyote, which is extracted from, and psilocybin is slightly different than the shrooms, which is it, it's extracted from. There's other um, chemicals within the shrooms that can be of use to you. So the way that you approach this kind of thing is that there's that main chemical that's going to take you to that other realm, but um, I, at least on my my approach is that I have a, a flavor palette that I take in on my tongue as that psychedelic is going over. Okay. And so in, in my thinking, the chemicals, the saliva spreads out all of the chemicals. And so it leaves me a trace indicator of all of the different chemicals that are going to be psychoactive within me. The main one being the psilocybin hmm. in, in the transit, in the voyage and the, and the journey, I can at times take my mind back down to my tongue and grab one of those other molecules for what it will give me at that point. It's screwy, it's screwy, but it, it you know, and, and it may be that you've got to be genetically uh, schizophrenic in order for these things to work. I don't know. Yeah, I do I've, know, you know, I've had ayahuasca experiences, you know, trying to, and I, it just, I would just walk out of the desert at 6 a.m. with, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing really happening. It just wasn't working for me. And I can take small doses and I can talk to the machine elves of um, uh, Terrence McKenna fame, right? So I went to the area of the dead on one of these trips. I wanted to find out. My, I knew my brother was sick. I knew he was dying. I needed to see what he was going to be facing. Do you uh, believe, Cliff, that they're, uh, I mean, uh, when you interact with these beings, are they, as they say, in another dimension, or are they on this plane? I mean, do we? You mean know? like phys physically? Physically, yeah, physically. Oh, physicality is uh, is <laughs> immaterial, okay, because it's all just another flavor of consciousness. So, and the way I conceive of it, the way it was taught to me by the guy with the skin 
uh, the, the emotional skin uh, who taught me the other techniques on the mescaline is that you, you can't conceive of yourself as this um, uh, conscious being per se, okay? The better way to think about it is that there's, you're in a lake and you are the material of the lake, which is consciousness, but your, your perception of the consciousness is this sphere that is your filter through which consciousness is flowing and your and it's as though the sphere had a, a, por, a, a was porous and consciousness could soak in and soak out at a defined level right and so you would hold on to consciousness for a while and and it would drift away from you and so on uh, and this is the course of a life the course of a day into unconsciousness at sleep etc and that any time you wanted to if you knew the technique you could take your bubble and like collapse it and just recreate it over here in another part of the lake and it would fill up with consciousness and you'd be fine. Uh, you, you use the word filter is, uh, and it's a term I've been thinking about for the last year. As I see people process information, particularly when you look at politics and everything, and everyone could get dosed with the same information, but one person, this is like everything they say happens the other person, nothing they say or hope for happens. And it's got me thinking, is it, is it about filters? People just have good filters, bad filters when it comes to information. Like, uh, Let's not put um, pejorative labels. Let's just say, you know, some function better under certain conditions with certain inf information coming in and, and others. So, you know, uh, I'm an authority um, avoider kind of a guy, right? I wouldn't, I was born into the military. I'm a military brat. The worst thing in the world for me would have been to, to try to uh, take on that uh, way to absorb information and go into the military because my, I'm schizophrenic and, you know, in that sense, my brain wouldn't have accommodated. I would have been a rebellious that would have ended up in trouble, etc. So it's a matter of understanding um, our our situation at the moment relative to consciousness in general, okay? This situation that a moment for all of us is as a result of this body's life. But that, that encapsulation of this body's life relative to our life here relative to consciousness should include, in my opinion, an awareness of intuition, which is the boiled down substance of all your previous lives brought forward to this life. Uh, that kind of thing. So our, this body's life also encapsulates the idea that you will have other bodies and other lives and that those bodies and, and other lives won't necessarily be as affected uh, as you are within this body. So maybe when I reincarnate, I won't have schizophrenic genes, right? And so I won't have these experiences because I'm done with them. I've used them up. I've learned what I needed to and I can go on to whatever else is prepared for me. Sort of makes sense. It does make sense because I understand the concept of karma and past lives, and I do believe in that. In fact, myself, I was in the military two days after I left high school. And I stayed there for 11 years, and it was, I always wanted to do it. And years later, when I had found a, an astrologer, we did my birth chart, and he said, You have the heaviest karma I have ever seen died early, died often, you know, the, the soldier out there on the frontiers, they got run over by the barbarians again and again. And he's like, <laughs> right. and he said, you know, this lifetime, you actually have something you've never had before, and that is choice. Uh, and had I not left the military at 28, the fates would apply, just said, well, let's just take it out, take them out, start all over again. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of where you're, you just have these intuition, like you said, the intuitions of the past, and also, I guess we get into that dharma where we know, hey, it's time to break out of something and do something. Maybe that's what encourages people to uh, have uh, psychedelic experiences, trying to kind of escape where they are, move from where they are to another level. Uh, I would, I would 100% agree with that, and I would particularly emphasize the word escape, it's because mm. so many people find themselves tortured by the conditions of their own mind, their own thoughts, and uh, they seek relief one way or another. You know, this is the structure of our planet. This is what leads people to alcoholism, et cetera. I personally think that, you know, psychedelics are far more, uh, far better teachers. Uh, but some people are simply working out their karma and, and won't be educated in this life. They're just going to be, just burn it out, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, do countries have karmas? Do planets have Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, it's really easy to understand too. Okay, at a, as a physical level. 
uh, because uh, karma is a physical thing. There's this religion called Jain, which is this weird kind of a technical religion with a God that's formless. And the, a lot of Germans like it, even though it originated in India. There was this German uh, practitioner of the Jain religion who quantified karma uh, from the Jain um, cosmology. Uh, the Jain cosmology predates or is equally as old as the Vedic tradition and, and mm. seems to reference stuff very much older. Okay, it comes from that same uh, Indian subcontinent. But anyway, this guy went through all the karmans, okay? So uh, karma is a is a collective word for these individual critters called karmans that glom onto our, our physical uh, bodies at a level of an energetic shell that we cannot appreciate with our senses. So you have an energetic shell that can be determined by an EMP machine. So I can stand away from you 60 feet away with a sensitive device and pick up your heartbeat, right? Mm -hmm. I can pick up your, your, the heat radiating from you and all of this kind of thing. We can see your conscious, the consciousness making your mind work by heat patterns alone. So we have these energetic shells that we cannot appreciate with our eyes. We have to use techniques to get them, infrared, et cetera, et cetera. These shells exist in a number of layers out from us. Within these, each of these shells are like... Um, larger additions of our physical condensate body. Your karmans that you have to work out on or that you accept this in this life are working their way through these energetic shells until they, they contact your body and that's when they manifest. So I've got scars all over to hell and gone and if I had been uh, astute enough and had, been, uh, had a, a good enough vision, I could have seen the scar on this finger coming at me through those shells and would not necessarily have, have had to accept the uh, damage to my body that created that if I had figured out some way to deal with that karma. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that being said, all of our shells that extend out from us in a larger sense touch and blend and, and intermingle with everybody else around us. This is why, as a person that was highly sensitive, sensitized, I was unable to be around crowds because I felt their key, their life force, impinging on mine the way that pinging comes from a, a submarine or, or a computer right. to a server, right? And so it, it drove me fucking crazy, it drove me nuts. Um, is, that, know, is that, would you say that's typical of an introvert then? That, you know, that, no, no, no. That's typical of people that carry the um, uh, schizophrenic gene, whether it's manifesting or not. Uh, okay. Uh, schizo true schizophrenics are self-isolating. Uh, schizotypicals are self-isolating. We, we typically don't have a lot of friends. Uh, you know, it, a lot of it has to do with the sweat and the so on and the nature of our, our brains. Um, uh, schizophrenics are thrown out because the more they're agitated by the larger number of people around them, the more they ex ex uh, extrude the stuff, the hormones and the pheromones that causes all of the problems to begin with. And so it's this feedback loop that gets them chucked out of the village. <laughs> I, was, I was at a conference with a schizophrenic and he, it was the, it was the uh, opening uh, speech of the of the conference it was an academic conference and this fellow got up during the q a and just ripped the lead sp speaker a new one ripped and yes it was vulgar but everything was absolutely dead on every critique, <laughs> everything was so right. self-based because when right. he tried to when he tried to score back he says no because you did this and this and this and your agency did this this and this and the level of discomfort in the room oh. was off the charts. And when we walked out, everyone, of course, is looking down like, wow, that is like really different. And I got to spend a weekend with this guy. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. And so, and you see why they're pitched out of the commonality. But there is value to them if used properly, don't you That's, think? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why the British... Uh, okay, so at one point uh, back um, uh, in the early 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, the people that formed the Tavistock Institute went to the British royals and said, we can identify and eliminate schizophrenics from the uh, society. And we can do this very quickly in, in only two generations. Um, and the British royals said, holy shit, don't you dare because so many of the royals are afflicted because of their inbreeding. Mm. And the, th the thing of it is, there's another story. There's this really cool guy, Robert Sapolsky. He has, uh, he's from Stanford. 
he's probably retired now, but his, he's living forever on YouTube in his lectures. Okay, he did this just brilliant lecture on the religiosity of religion. Uh, and okay, because he his uh, the the and he's a biological uh, or he's an evolutionary biologist, and his and his thing was that um, we need schizophrenics. That Moses, if you believe the story, was a schizophrenic. Okay, he was a schizophrenic who saw uh, flames where there weren't any, heard voices where there weren't any, and we now have a religion built around him. Almost all of the religions of the planet that have a central or one or two figures are built around schizophrenics. And, and he has this just beautiful lecture and some of the, and he's got this nice little story in there, okay? And it's about the Winnebago tribe. And there's actually a tribe of Indians, right? Native Americans mm -hmm. named Winnebago. And this guy comes from the Cherokee nation in South Carolina or North Carolina, I forget which, goes on up north and to um, talk to some people at the Winnebago tribe. He goes on up to the Winnebago tribe and he sees all kinds of activity and they're doing great economically just doing fine. And there's a steady stream of people heading towards their shaman's teepee or his tent or his house where I forget how he described it. And, uh, and the guy is just doing a booming business, you know, because shaman typically, they, even though they're isolated out of the, mm -hmm. the village, right, they still provide services to the village, speaking of voices, you know, intuitive readings, all this kind of crap, right? Anyway, and so uh, the, the guy from the Cherokee Nation, he's visiting a distant cousin up there in the Winnebago's, and they're sitting around on a fence discussing this long line of people heading in to see the shaman. And, uh, you know, the guy at the Winnebago tribe, he's all puffed up. Man, we got a good shaman here. This guy is kick-ass. You know, we got crops coming up, the yin-yang. And, you know, he tells us where the big fish are. And, you know, two years ago, he found us a bear that fed the whole village for two days. Just just a, a really good guy. And then the, the guy from the Winnebago looks at his uh, distant cousin from the Cherokee Nation who's just nodding. Damn, wish we had one like that and stuff like this. And he looks at him and says, thank God there's only one. <laughs> okay, Cliff. Yeah. In uh, one of the videos of yours, or it was somebody else's video, but you were the guest uh, that I watched, you mentioned that you had followed the show Stargate Universe, and you said there was mm -hmm. a story behind that, and you never got back to that story. Boy, I, uh, as to why I followed it, or about yeah, the technology well, it, itself? He had mentioned something about um, something you were relating about alien technology. Um, he said, oh, it's like Stargate. And you said, ah, you, you sort of blew off the whole Stargate mythology, except for the show Stargate, Star Universe. Stargate Universe. And I, okay. I don't much care for Stargate, but I did watch that show. I liked okay. that show. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a weird thing, okay? I don't know about previous stuff because I didn't watch it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I watched the very first movie right. uh, because I liked the guy who was the central character. The, um, I can't think of the name James of the actor. Spader? That's him, right. Yep. Okay, so I like I like that, and it was a it was a good show. And but, Kurt Russell. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, and they had some they had some really twisted characters. You know, it wasn't comic book, so it was it was okay. It was comic book. It was campy, but it was all right. Um, uh, but anyway, Stargate Universe had something that none of the other shows have, and they have the um, uh, an allusion to the definitive or a defining mystery that the people in area 51 and all these other places in the deep underground areas are in, involved with at the moment. Okay. And here's the, here's what's going on. The uh, Voyager spacecraft here that we shot off from earth Voyager two, which actually left before Voyager one, these guys haven't left our solar system in spite of NASA's claims to the contrary. And that was what 73 or something that went up. That, that era, I can't remember yeah. the exact, years right but they they go for a long damn time and basically what we did was to shoot them out laterally so to speak from our our planet headed out toward what we think of as the thin edge of our of our solar system not back away from us nor towards the sun okay mm -hmm. so it is true that our solar system is basically sort of teardrop shape and it's thinner in as we have a, a longer aspect than we do a wide aspect and so they shot it through towards the wide aspect to just shoot them out into space to see what the hell happened and they've never gotten out there okay it's because they ran into something and and they're continually sending back information and they kept slowing down and slowing down and slowing down and slowing down as they went forward in spite of all of the efforts of the NASA guys and their calculations and stuff, there should have been no slowing down as it approached this point that we had defined in our minds as being the edge of the solar system. They didn't think there was an actual edge to the solar system. 
They didn't think there was any kind of a physical barrier there. They were just shooting it off in that direction. And it was an area that they had defined mathematically as being the, the separation between our solar system and deep space. Well, lo and behold, they discovered that our solar system is like a cell. And they've shot the, the voyagers into the inside of the cell membrane. And it's, it's not really a cell membrane per se. It is the envelope that is formed electrically by our sun pushing through a medium that is not a vacuum. So interstellar space is not a vacuum. Vacuum only exists behind the sun. And we've proven this with the uh, voyagers because they can't get out of our solar system. They're still being drug along with the sun. Their, their pathway is ever so slightly oblique, but it so keeps slowing down. So you're a solid object? Not solid, an energetic barrier. Hmm. An energetic barrier that's formed by the plasma of the sun that goes back with the heliopause. So the heliopause is a self-defining cell wall in that sense, that, and the vacuum only exists behind the sun. Kind of like a float stream we're all inhabiting here? Correct. And huh. so we're, we're in the wake behind the sun, and our planets can't be spun out of the solar system, and equally, no comet is ever coming into our solar system. So Halley's Comet exists right. in our solar system. It never leaves us. It doesn't go out around the universe and find us. It's within our solar system and comes back. So, so does space travel make sense at the end no, of the day? No. There's, this is why the, the story of the NUMMO is so damn fascinating, okay? Because if you have a correct understanding of the electric universe and how things actually operate, you know that there is no spaceship. There is no... Um, start uh, starship or Stargate universe kind of a no. And see, in so, fact, you know, Star Trek universe, isn't going to go travel. No, no, because they, there's solid, there's material there. There's something there. It's energetic. It's dust. It's full of stuff, and that's where the friction comes around our sun that creates the corona and the plasma and stuff. But getting back to Stargate universe, they've got in there an analog to what they encountered in our solar system because in Stargate universe they talk about the hiss or the hum or something coming from the far end of the universe and that's where the Stargate universe boat was gonna go to to find out basically what the hell it was. Okay, and so they in that show they're actually replicating some of the things that we now know. In that show they also have these, um, and maybe in other Stargate shows too, I don't know because I didn't watch any of them, but in that Stargate universe they have these things that were like personality stones. And you could you'd put them on your head or touch them or something, and you, and you could swap personality with somebody at the other stone who actually happened to, to have it. And so it was like you would put your consciousness in their body, and their consciousness would come into your body, right? And so this is how people on the Stargate Universe boat were contacting and dealing with people back and forth in uh, at Earth, was these stones that allowed this, well, this is quantum entanglement. Okay, and so they're telling us in that show some of the technologies that they're kind of developing. Um, by so they, we wouldn't physically, our bodies travel, but our consciousness would travel. Right, right. I was uh, in a Japanese literature class and was taught by a, an amazingly old Japanese uh, academic. And we were talking about Kawabata, and I said, well, Kawabata offed himself. And he goes, oh, no, 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 Kawabata didn't do that. He was simply having an out-of-body experience. And the body got up and hit the gas. And he said, being Kawabata, we would go to a temple, we'd check in, and we would just travel, travel the universe. And, of course, the class, this is, what, 1980? <laughs> and we're all looking at this going, Really? <laughs> yeah, you're like goes, a big woo zone yeah, here. Yeah, yeah and yeah. he goes, "Oh, it was great. Take trip, never leave farm." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is that so that, that is see, that there's, the future of space travel? Then we no, no, no. I don't believe so. I think we will corpor corporeally uh, transit space because of uh, Bob Lazar and some of the information that he released in Element One Fifteen. Okay, so Bob Lazar, you know about him. He supposedly worked at Area 51. He comes on out and he talks about Area 51. He gets a ration of shit from the government. He gets a ration of shit from everybody that doesn't believe him. He goes off and he forms a really cool business. I dealt with that business. So I've had contact with Bob Lazar. The really cool thing about Bob Lazar is that he was a smart fellow, okay? And so he's like um, uh, a psychonaut who goes and, and talks to mantids and brings back a design. He didn't do that kind of thing, but what he did was to bring back a chunk of information that occurred uh, prior to uh, the year 2000. 
And he brought back this chunk of information and this chunk of information was about an element called 115. Does, did not, does not exist on this planet. And had no, we had, he had no way of knowing about the properties of it or anything at all. And then five or six years later, boom, we discover element 115. We create the stuff. We know its properties and damned if it doesn't replicate what Bob Lazar was telling us before the stuff ever appeared on the planet. And so that to me tells, tells me that no matter what other bullshit is spewed out about Bob Lazar, he was accurate years in advance in the description of the atomic number and the properties of this particular element. And so Bob Lazar, he's a good, he's not an abductee. He's more like, you know, uh, uh, a throw out of the military. So he's sort of like, you mm -hmm. know, my lab experiment gone bad, but it tells me that his other information is worth examining because, because he was so accurate on that particular element. And because it has exactly the properties as described by him years in advance, then also it, it occurs to me that maybe the engine that he was describing that used element 115 is as he was describing it. And then later on, uh, probably the year 2000, maybe I started dealing in uh, caliber buying and, and uh, uh, securing for my own use calibrated um, uh, nuclear gear that uh, Bob Lazar uh, had his hands on that he uh, repaired, calibrated or built himself. And he did quality fine work. Um, and so I had this contact with him. And so his interaction with me as a customer uh, and a supplier at that time at a highly technical level tells me this guy ain't bullshitting. And I, everything I got from him was as he said it 100%. So this fellow was in a hole in the ground. He saw some stuff. He brought back information that is valuable and has been validated. So as far as I'm concerned, Bob Lazar, he's top notch, 100% you know, as opposed to Dan Burrish and all these other guys that say they also work there and so on. Doesn't do me any good to bring me back the name of a supposed alien, you know. Um, anyway, though, so um, it's kind of, I know my attitude is really pissy. It's kind of like, you know, what have you done for me lately? But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a good way to validate stuff, right? If you can tell me something five years in advance of it manifesting, then I would say that, you know, you've been in the deep woo and you knew what you were doing. Well, Cliff, we've hit the 90 minute mark. Uh, KMO, is there, uh, you know, because I'm thinking for just for our viewers, I, I wanted to kind of stop right around the 90 sure. minute mark. It's, I, my mind is, I don't know about you, KMO, but my mind has been blown here talking with Cliff. <laughs> Well, I've spent the last Sorry few days that. here in Cliff High Space, so it's a, it's a familiar feeling. But uh, before you go, Cliff, I'd like to get you to comment on the images of. Um, pyramids in Antarctica that are making the rounds right now. I see them basically every time I open a web browser. Um, well, that's of course due to the AI, assuming that you want to see them, right? You know, I accidentally the other day clicked on a um, uh, Korean uh, pre-teen pop video. Mm -hmm. And now YouTube thinks I'm, I'm gonna wanna become an expert <laughs> in Korean pre-teen pop. <laughs> but, but, but okay, so the, the images that are showing up about Antarctica are really interesting, all right? What's really, really interesting is that even Dr. Joseph Farrell, uh, uh, a known hardened skeptic about all of the woo-woo around Antarctica is starting to say, hmm, some of this stuff that they're seeing in some of these photos, you know, has to have another explanation because it doesn't look like a chunk of snow sitting out there. Okay, so it's curious about the Antarctic pyramid stuff now because of a geopolitical move that's been made. You're familiar with what China has done recently, right? In particular, what, what have they done? Uh, Antarctica, the, okay, so Antarctica is a military controlled zone. That military controllers is basically the US, the Germans and a few other nations that were involved with each other uh, in World War II. And at the time that they controlled Antarctica, they said, no airplanes, no flying, no nothing. You can't fly here. Never going to happen. Now, if you go to Google Earth and you look around the edge of Antarctica, you see a lot of airfields and you see a lot of military planes. Okay. So not like fighter jets, but like transports, that kind of thing. Right. So there are people flying in Antarctica. China the other day said, we're a nation on this planet. We're assigned signatories to this ar arrangement here in terms of the governance of Antarctica. We're bringing up the issue of no-fly zones. We don't want them anymore. And they started landing jets. And big jets, happy jets, people with coming out of the jets with big signs saying, we're happy Chinese, happy to be here in Antarctica. This is concurrent with a lot of the stuff they're doing in the Arctic. 
Okay, so China's got some stuff going on, and China has two state-run UFO magazines, okay, state-sanctioned. And they're, they're not trying to control, they're not trying to shoehorn the Chinese people into disbelief. They are hard-headed engineers that want to discover what the hell's going on here. And so China has an official stance at the Politburo level that Antarctica has stuff that they want to get hold of. And there's been a lot of talk in China about the pyramids. Hmm. Okay, and so it's kind of coincidental, coincidence theorist here, that the Chinese chose that particular area that they're in for their um, big long uh, airport that they're starting to build, or their long runway. And so that begs some other, other questions there. So if you look at the, the runway that they've just even started to mess about in the snow, the projection for it looks like it's a serious kind of an effort. Like mm. not just, you know, one jet a week or something, right? But like something that might have to accommodate tens of thousands of people a day. So hot damn, hot damn. Wow. So China is looking to increase Antarctic activity by a significant, really significant factor. Right. And, and there's, there's the resources. Okay. So this is an understood. China is 1.2 billion people. They need resources. They've always need resources. They're the dominant uh, nation on the planet. Anything that can get them resources where they don't have to harm people is the route they're going to go because they recognizing harming people gets them bad, bad energy, which costs them more money, basically, right? And gets in the way. And so, um, so their way in which they operate is very particular, has been ever since the takeover of Tibet. And you can see this being done in the same fashion in every single one of their ways in which they move out. It's a policy, it's a formula, and so on, and it's broken now. Okay, they're not doing in Antarctica what they've done every other place. Now, true, there's no native population for them to have to worry about there. But they're doing things in a way that, in my mind, suggests that there's been a change of mind in the uh, high ends of the Chinese state and that, that that in my way of thinking that change of mind should yield to us at some point much bigger levels of transparency as to what they're finding. Interesting. Is that because they see a much bigger prize than we might be seeing down there? Right. Because the Chinese have keyed in on now. Okay. So in my, in my thinking, in woo-woo world, all the militaries are down there looting all of this technology, okay, that's in some way associated with older than or whatever. It's woo-woo technology at the same level as the 1947 uh, shootdowns of the, of the UFOs, right? Now, China, I think, is going to do, uh, in my opinion, what I think they're setting up for is to do this woo-woo acquisition in the open. So you think China is not necessarily going for ores coal, coal or, or, or metals or any of that, sh that stuff? No. They're going for technology. Yeah. Okay. Now here's something about the pyramids in Antarctica. Okay. There's a lot of pictures of them. They do exist. There's five-sided pyramids. There's tetrahedrons uh, there. There's many of the regular pyramids with the 51 degree angles in them. Some curious things that reinforce these ideas are the little Fitbits. You know, the, you guys right. heard about the, mm -hmm. that, okay? Those little Fitbits track people, and they track them via satellite. And so, oh, we didn't know all of our secret bases are, are uh, exposed because people. all of the <laughs> rangers, the Navy SEALs, <laughs> all of these guys, okay? All of the guys in the military, the hardcore warrior types, love these devices, right? Because they love to have numbers to measure themselves against. I mean, I, you know, I know guys that wear super sophisticated Fitbit kind of things, uh, and, and they're of a military mindset. And so here's some really interesting things. If you look at the exposure that was offered by them tracking the Fitbits, you find places in Antarctica where people aggregate on the coast. Oh, my gosh. And then you wow. see, a, you see the, those same people, uh, and you can tell the difference between where they're there a lot, and they're doing their exercising and that kind of stuff, and where they're only there temporarily, because the uh, amount of light that is associated on the map with these. And so these people go to these places on the coast of Antarctica, and then you'll see that they're also being, in a, in a single line, transported to this other place. And this other place, hey, if you go and look at Google Earth, that looks curiously like a big damn giant pyramid. And these guys go into this pyramid, and you can see this in the little Fitbit thing, and then they appear at the top of it. 
No so way. it is it is it is as though if you had to say oh well that's a mountain then you got to say okay so did they jump to the top of it because there's no transitory business <laughs> like if the went, elevator well if they went into the pyramid there's no way the fitbit is going to pick that up because of the density of it and it would naturally see them when they popped out the top when they were exposed to the satellite again and there's there's stuff like this going on all over there's other areas which are the reverse where you see all of the little Fitbit things uh, aggregate over time. They're doing staging. I recognize the logistics involved in the staging. And then they collect everybody in, the, in this and they go off in little groups and they go to this, this little tiny sp space in Antarctica that is whited out in um, Google Earth. It, I mean, they just put a mask on it. You can't see anything at all, no detail. And then when they go there, these, these, the Fitbits gradually disappear in strength. They go down. And wow. then, and then, some period of time later, they're back over on the coast, without without the whole transitory stuff again. So, what the hell is going on there? So, when you say they are going down, are you are you talking about down into a depression or down into the uh, something the underground? Under the, underground, and at some point, uh, it's hard for me to even estimate, but at some point, the signal disappears. Wow. Yeah, and, and then it, you know, and they're just like the ground is eating all of these little Fitbit signals and they just keep going down there and down there and down there. There was this one area where I looked and there was over the course of about in that, and they don't have that exposed anymore. So you can't, you, it, it's on uh, archive on the internet somewhere, I'm sure. But uh, over the course of like a week, there was like 30 or 40, I think it was like 42 or something, 45 of these individual Fitbits that all aggregated in this staging area. And then uh, they went there, and then five of them came back, presumably driving five vehicles back from wherever the hell these guys were dropped off. And then the remainder of them, over the course of just, I don't know, maybe 36 hours or so, gradually just disappeared. It's the spookiest effect. How do you access the Fitbit data? Uh, just go into a search on uh, Fitbit betrays secret sites on Google and it'll show you a bunch of different places that you can get at it. The place that had it in real time live uh, understandably got shut down by the military. And it's just a website. And you just pull up whatever map area you want. And it also, of course, showed all kinds of secret bases all over the, the U.S. And, it, and all over the planet. Uh, places where people were wearing Fitbits that, you know, I mean, it shows you Area 51 because there's people that, that jog there with Fitbits on, right? <laughs> Too funny. Yeah. Well, uh, well, Cliff, boy, I, I hate to have to wrap this up. This has been a great time. The, the hour and a half has just flown by. Um, we, can do it, we can do it again in the future. No worries. I am really looking forward to that. Again, Cliff, I, KMO, anything you want to add before we depart? No, no, this is a bunch of fun. Okay, cool. And good, good luck on your comic, you know. Thank you much. Watch out for those shoulders and the traps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. Have a great one. Okay. Bye-bye.